Welcome to St. Michael's Church. We are an Anglican church in the heart of Highgate Village in North London. We're meeting today to commemorate the death of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which took place 187 years ago. He died two years after our church was opened and was here physically for the opening ceremony in 1832. Samuel Taylor Coleridge's death brought an end to a fascinating and inspirational life during which he wrote and produced some of the greatest poems and thoughts in English language. We're here to remember his death and the deaths of his wife, Sarah, daughter, Sarah, son-in-law, Henry, and grandson, Herbert, who are buried alongside him. They were originally buried in the local churchyard. But 60 years ago, his and his family's remains were reinterred in the crypt of this church, immediately below where I am standing. Later, with the help of Sir Paul Coleridge, we shall explore those parts of the village which still bring back memories of the poet and his life here. We shall also hear two distinguished academics discuss the impact of our church and village on his life. And we shall hear also some music specially composed by our director of music to honor Coleridge's family's resting place here in the crypt at Highgate. <music> And that is where we're going now, to the burial crypt itself. That was once the wine cellar of the house which stood here before the church was built. It's this burial site and its surrounds that we wish to develop into a community center dedicated to the life and works of this great poet, writer, thinker, and theologian. From there, Samuel's great, 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 great grandson, Richard Coleridge, will take up the story of the poet's amazing relationship with Highgate. I shall join you at the end of this film as we pay further respects to the lives of the poet and his family. Thank you, Kenley, and thanks to all of you who have joined us on this commemorative day. As Cunley has said, I am the poet's great, 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 great grandson and I'm really pleased to be part of this amazing campaign to honour the poet and his immediate family. The wine cellar where I'm standing was built originally in the 1690s and was left standing when the house was demolished and the new church built over it in 1832. Over the years since the church was built, these curious marks and signs have appeared on its walls. Choir boy graffiti? Who knows? It's not even clear whether or not they were there when STC and his family's coffins were bricked up here in 1961. Thank you. 
remains lie just beyond the wall behind me. You can see their coffins through these air vents. Sadly, you can also see the rubble left here after the wall was built. You can see they really do deserve a better fate. The five colleges died from 1834 when Sam succumbed and all were subsequently buried in a mausoleum in the village churchyard, not far from here. Herbert, Herbie as he was known, was the last to be buried there in 1861. <laughs> But those were the endings, let's start with the beginnings. First a reading by Karina Marlowe from the great biography by Richard Holmes. Then Sir Paul Coleridge will show us Morton House where STC came to live when he first moved to Highgate. Coleridge took the local coach up from Tottenham Court Road to Highgate in the late afternoon of Friday the 12th of April. To his delight, he arrived outside the decorative iron railing of a substantial property, Morton House. To the west lay the rural undulations of Hampstead Heath, the lakes and the Vale of Health, and the beautiful Palladian mansion of Kenwood House. In front stood the clustered houses of Highgate Village, grouped round a trim little green pond square, embowered in oak and elm trees. A few shops ran down Highgate Hill to the toll gate, including bakers, butchers, two taverns, and rather conveniently, T. H. Duns, the chemist. Hello, I'm Paul Coleridge and I'm president of the Coleridge Trust. Our signature project, as you will have discovered by now, is to completely refurbish the crypt under St Michael's Church, where STC uh, is buried along with four of his close relatives. It's a project for which we would really value your support. Behind me here is Morton House in Highgate Village, where in 1816 Coleridge came to live. It was the home of a Dr James Gilman, who had lived here with his wife and their growing family. Gilman was an intellectual known to be especially interested in the business of addiction and in particular the effects of opium. And of course STC had wrestled with that problem for most of his life. In fact Gilman was somewhat grumpy when he was first introduced but Coleridge's charm, uh, legendary as it was, completely won him over. After an interview lasting some two hours he was heard to say, I felt indeed almost spellbound without desire of release. Two days later, SDC moved in with the Gilmans and stayed with them for the rest of his life and became a lifelong friend of the family. His rooms were on the top floor, which had views towards the City of London and also to the northwest towards STC's beloved Hampstead Heath. It was whilst here that Biographia Literaria was polished and published, and it was here that he polished up and published Christabel and Sibylline leaves. And of course it was here on a cold January day in 1823 that he was reconciled with his brilliant daughter Sarah who'd come to visit him with her friend Dorothy Wordsworth, her childhood friend, after a 12-year gap in their relationship. It was also of course where his first really determined fight back against his ad addiction began but also of course which he never really conquered. I would never pretend to be an expert in what STC achieved here in the village in Highgate, but I know a man who most certainly is. Malcolm Guite 
is steeped in Coleridge's magic and is a lifelong student of the man. His brilliant book, Mariner, tells how the poet so successfully sought to come to terms with the huge contradictions in his life whilst living peacefully here in the village. Let us now visit Malcolm in his study in Cambridge from where he is going to tell us a great deal more. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and uh, uh, an honour to find myself again part of uh, uh, a great celebration of the, the life and work and prophetic importance of Samuel Taylor Coleridge and especially that final fruition of his life and works in his time in Highgate and its association with St Michael's and this great effort to have a fitting monument to the poet. And uh, I wanted really to reflect a little bit on the importance of, since we're looking at a monument in a church, the importance of church life and the return to a great, uh, full, fruitful theological understanding in Coleridge's work. Of course, we all think quite naturally of the, the young romantic poet. We think of him and Wordsworth, you know, in all the joy and bliss of that Annas Mirabilis in the, the year 1797-98 and there they are in the context and in Somerset and writing the lyrical ballads which of course begins with the great ancient mariner uh, you know, resetting the whole course of English poetry or to think of him up in the lakes um, and that's right and proper um, but uh, like his own mariner, you know, he was a man on a really profound voyage and like his own man, he encountered horror and desperation and shipwreck. And as we know, he made a successful landfall, bringing the fruits of experience and wisdom with him. And in some ways, I think the Gilmans, to whom we owe so much, taking him into their house in the two different addresses in Highgate. Uh, Gilman was really almost like the, the pilot in the pilot boat that rescues the mariner. And uh, I want to think about his life then and particularly his liturgical, his church life and one of the things that fascinated him, in fact I came to it really rather after I'd written my book Mariner, um, was uh, an extraordinary annotation. It's well known that Coleridge wrote in the margins of other people's books and at first people were reluctant to lend him his books because he wrote in the margins and then there came a certain tipping point where people were desperate to lend him their books because he wrote in the margins. But he wrote in the margins of a book of common prayer belonging to Gilman, possibly for the benefit of Gilman's son, who was, I think he was helping to prepare for confirmation. He wrote an extraordinary note at the very beginning of the service for, for, for communion, the, the PCP communion service. And this is what he wrote, and it seems to me to go very much to the heart of his vision. Not that he was relapsing into some sad, you know, quiet Christianity after the efforts of being a romantic poet. On the contrary, he was finding in faith a fulfilment of the things he'd intuited earlier in his life. Anyway, this is what Coleridge wrote in the margin of that prayer book. The best preparation for taking this sacrament, better than any or all of the books or tracts composed to this end, is to read over and over again, and often on your knees, at all events with a kneeling and praying heart, the Gospel according to St John, till your mind is familiarised to the contemplation of Christ, the Redeemer and Mediator of mankind, yea, of every creature, as the living and self-subsisting Word, the very truth of all true being, the very being of all enduring truth, the reality which is the substance and unity of all reality. Astonishing words, just so generous, so inclusive. But when I read this, this marginal annotation for the first time, uh, there's Coleridge writing this, you know, in uh, some years after arriving at Highgate. My mind was taken not to the, the erudite sage of Highgate, but it was taken back to the glorious conclusion of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, where the mariner realises that essential truth. He prayeth best who loveth best all creatures great and small for the dear Lord who loveth us. He made and loveth all. 
And it's the mariner's realisation after he shot the albatross of the beauty of the water snake. So happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me and I blessed them unaware. But here's Coleridge, the mature Coleridge, coming to communion in this very parish and realising that the communion doesn't involve just us as human beings, but involves every species, as he says, says here, yea, of every creature. And that seems to me prophetic for a new ecologically aware um, faith that involves us in the sense of the network, the delicate network of all the life on this earth. And, um, of course, Coleridge was immensely attracted to John's Gospel because of that, that opening line, in the beginning was the word, in Archeon, her logos, the notion of word and of all things being constituted in the word and God speaking things into being was so important. The sense for Coleridge that the beauties of nature, each with their own proper glory, were also not only things in themselves, as words are things in themselves, but also like words, they were utterances, they were speaking, they were full of meaning. He'd intuited that much earlier in his life, indeed in that Annus Mirabilis in the context when he wrote Frost at Midnight and uh, thought of young Hartley growing up and said, you know, thou my child shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores beneath the crags of ancient mountains. And then he goes on to say, as you remember, so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit and by giving make it ask. He'd seen that already, but he hadn't realised the full grounded consequences of that. But later on he wrote a little note when the moon was shining on him as a lonely man in Malta and he said there's something about this moon dim glimmering through the dewy window pane. It is Logos. It's speaking a word to me. And eventually, as we know, in the Biographia Literary, which is published from Highgate, he, he, he came to ground his whole sense of what it was to be human in in the notion of the divine word and the word speaking within us as well as speaking us into being. And um, he writes this note in the Book of Common Prayer, the liturgy of the church, and he returned to these liturgies and homilies, not, as is sometimes suggested, I think, in some literary histories, as a kind of relapse of exhaustion as though he kind of collapses into the back pew of St Michael's in Highgate because he ceased to think. On the, It was not a comfortable pew, on the contrary. He comes back to the church with a new full realisation of what this has always meant, a, a kind of reimagination and rediscovery of it. And um, indeed the very words, the final words, the last great paragraph of the Biographia Literaria um, speaks of the liturgies and the homilies. Let me remind you of that passage, it's, it's, it's glorious. And here he thinks of not only the word speaking things into being or ourselves being words spoken by the word, but he actually thinks of the whole cosmos as a kind of echo of the song of love between the Father and the Son. This is what he wrote. Christianity, as taught in the liturgy and homilies of our church, Though not discoverable by human reason, is yet in accordance with it, that link follows link by necessary consequence, that religion passes out of the ken of reason only where the eye of reason has reached its own horizon, and that faith is then but its continuation, even as the day softens away into sweet twilight, and twilight hushed and breathless steals into the darkness. It is night, sacred night. The upraised eye views only the starry heaven which manifests itself alone. Uh, it's wonderful, you can imagine Coleridge walking out into Highgate in the days when it really was a bit of a village and there wouldn't have been the light pollution and seeing this great starry sky. There'd be the starry heaven which manifests itself alone and the outward beholding is fixed on the sparks twinkling in the awful depth, those suns in other worlds, only to preserve the soul, steady and collected in its pure act of inward adoration to the great I am and to the filial word that reaffirmeth it from eternity to eternity. 
whose choral echo is the universe. And those are the last words of the great work. Extraordinary. We, everything, are the echo of this, this relationship between the great I am and the filial word. It's extraordinary. And all this, in a sense, Adam breaks it out of, written in Highgate, and there he is, annotating this book of common prayer. So it's wonderful that, um, that this church should be making in its crypt a fitting memorial for Coleridge, who I think revivified and helped us all to reimagine the vital importance of the theology that we've inherited. I'd like to finish just by reading you uh, the poem I wrote myself for Coleridge, and with which I concluded my book Mariner, but which I'd published before that book was ever written. Um, as a personal thank you, and of course at the heart of all of these memorials is that great epitaph there at, at uh, which Coleridge wrote himself, epitaph there at St Michael's, um, Stop Christian Passerby, Stop Child of God. I have a little wall above me here, and I make that the beginning of my poem, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Stop Christian Passerby, Stop Child of God. You made your epitaph imperative and stopped this wedding guest. But I am glad to stop with you and start again to live from that pure source, the all-renewing stream whose living power is imagination and know myself a child of the I am, open and loving to his whole creation. Your glittering eye taught mine to pierce the veil, to let his light transfigure all my seeing, to serve the shaping spirit whom I feel and make with him the poem of my being. I follow where you sail towards our haven, your wide wake lit with glimmerings of heaven. Thank you, Malcolm. As you've heard, SDC stayed with the Gilmans in Morton House for seven years. Although he still faced tragedies in his personal life, it's where he began to find that safe haven which Malcolm so well describes. And importantly, as Paul said, it's where he re-engaged with his uniquely gifted daughter, Sarah. But after those years in Morton House, his life changed again. As Holmes puts it. While Coleridge was away at Ramsgate during the autumn of 1823, Gilman moved house to number three, The Grove, in Highgate. It was a fine three-storey brick Georgian residence, set back from a gravelled alley of chestnut trees on the eastern flank of Hampstead Heath. Gilman gave him the finest upper room, a large attic bedroom, to which he later added an extension, looking westwards across the heath to Kenwood. Reached by a fine oak staircase, this became his final home, an airy retreat fitted out with a long wall of bookshelves and decorated with portraits of his family and friends, the picture of Sarah having pride of place. On his working table, he kept pots of plants, especially a myrtle, which he had described in a poem as the symbol of love lost and found. This is Highgate Hill as it is today, and I'm standing by the door to the apothecary's shop where SDC arranged to get his illicit supplies of opium. And it was here that the sage could look down across Islington and the city of London, just as we can today. And indeed, it was from here that he watched Byron's funeral cortege pass by. One summer evening, when Dr. Gilman himself lay prostrate with fever, SDC is said to have deputized for him as an emergency physician. He recalled, and I quote, panting down Highgate Hilltop to soothe a distraught mother whose infant baby had suddenly died. According to Richard Holmes, as SDC poured out his sympathies, he felt as though he wanted to be a faith healer. I felt or fancied a power in me to concentrate my will that I have never felt or fancied before. We will now join Dr. Seamus Perry, Professor of English Literature at Oxford, in the chapel of Balliol College, to tell us more about Coleridge's extraordinary and renowned magnetic charm and the life he led with Dr. Gilman.
Coleridge's health was failing in the spring of 1816, and his doctor thought the best course of action was to place him in the care of a physician as a permanent house guest. Uh, his idea was one Dr. James Gilman of Highgate, and Gilman agreed to the proposition. So on the 13th of April, 1816, Coleridge duly turned up at Morton House on Highgate Hill, where the Gilmans were then living. James Gilman later touchingly recalled that a visitor present at this first meeting with Coleridge discreetly withdrew, mistaking them for old friends. That story may be inventive, but uh, Gilman wasn't wrong to imply that they hit it off at once and that Coleridge uh, felt himself immediately uh, at home in a place uh, where he would be able to work. He was never to leave the Gilman household. In November 1823, he moved with his hosts to the famous address, 3 The Grove. Originally, he occupied a room on the second floor next to the Gilman's bedroom, but when he discovered the attic, with its view over Cane Wood, he requested a move. I am specially delighted with my room, he wrote. G has done wonders. The wonders in question being some building work that transformed the sloping attic ceiling into a flat roof so as to make the room more spacious and able to contain more books. He called it his book study bedroom. And it was there that he established himself in his new and final role as sage, the sage of Highgate. He was actually only in his 40s, but everyone thought him much older, as becomes a sage. He was, as his estranged wife Sarah, back home in Keswick, was surprised to learn quite grey-haired. Nevertheless, if his powers were diminished, they had certainly not been extinguished by the trials of his ill health and his opium addiction. His old friend Charles Lamb was not the only one to find, as Lamb said, his essentials not touched. He is very bad, but then he wonderfully picks up another day, and his face, when he repeats his verses, hath its ancient glory, an archangel, a little damaged. The striking figure of Coleridge seems to have become quickly established as a feature of the locality, and in just a few years' time, he became part of the diligent literary tourist's itinerary. He had visitors at all times, but from 1820 or so, he established Thursday afternoons and evenings as the time when the intellectually curious were most welcome to attend what he called his conversazioni, or, as he ruefully admitted, since he did almost all the talking himself, one versazioni. These events are slightly hard to imagine. Reports suggest that Coleridge just spoke on some abstruse metaphysical topic, sometimes literally for hours, and the young men, for well, they were all men, tried to keep up, murmuring admiration when Coleridge paused for a moment or two at the end of a spoken paragraph and whispering to one another things such as, that last was very fine, or he is beyond himself today. This may sound like a strange, cerebral sort of spectator sport, but Coleridge quickly built up a loyal following of Questers for Truth, a set of what were often brilliant young men, many of whom would go on to be uh, prominent members of the Victorian intelligentsia. Lee Hunt painted a vivid portrait of the Highgate Sage in his autobiography. It is no secret, said Hunt, that Mr. Coleridge lives in the grove at Highgate with a friendly family who have sense and kindness enough to know that they do themselves an honour by looking after the comforts of such a man. His room looks upon a delicious prospect of wood and meadow with coloured gardens under the window like an embroidery to the mantle. I thought when I first saw it that he had taken up his dwelling place like an abbot. Here he cultivates his flowers and has a set of birds for his pensioners who come to breakfast with him. He may be seen taking his daily stroll up and down with his black coat and white locks and a book in his hand and is a great acquaintance of the little children. His main occupation, I believe, is reading. Coleridge was probably not a very good parent, but he always loved children, including his own, and his relationship with the children of Highgate does indeed seem from various sources to have been affectionate and avuncular. 
And if the main impression Coleridge left on Highgate's children was astonishment and bewilderment, then that didn't make them much different from the grown-ups. Meeting Coleridge was always to meet someone who talked, but by this stage of his life, his talking had become a vocation. The celebrated comic actor Charles Matthews, who knew Coleridge, did a famous impersonation of Coleridge stopping an apothecary's boy, suddenly overwhelmed with a philosophical thought. Coleridge. Boy, did you never reflect upon the magnificence and beauty of the external universe? Boy. No, sir, never, etc., etc. And here is the poet and man of letters Samuel Rogers, who called on him in Highgate with a distinguished fellow guest and recorded his own impression of those impressive powers in his journal. Wordsworth and myself had walked to Highgate to call on Coleridge when he was living at Gilman's. We sat with him two hours, he talking the whole time without intermission. When we left the house, we walked for some time without speaking. What a wonderful man he is, exclaimed Wordsworth. Wonderful indeed, said I. What depth of thought, what richness of expression, continued Wordsworth. There's nothing like him that I ever heard, rejoined I. Another pause. Pray, inquired Wordsworth, did you precisely understand what he said about the Kantian philosophy? Not precisely. Or about the plurality of worlds? I can't say I did. In fact, if the truth must out, I did not understand a syllable from one end of his monologue to the other. Wordsworth, no more did I. Wordsworth once said that he was intellectually indebted to only two people, his sister Dorothy and Coleridge, so there is something rather poignant as well as funny about this failure to make the old connection. There is no doubt that his life at Highgate was a late blessing for Coleridge and his more waspish contemporaries, such as Thomas de Quincey, thought he had rather landed on his feet with the devoted Gilmans. It's no less clear that the Gilmans, both James and Anne, thought they had landed on their feet, having Coleridge about the house. Gilman, although much younger, lasted only a few years after Coleridge's death and his widow had no doubt that he had never recovered from the loss. Their granddaughter, Lucy Watson, who had known Anne Gilman as an old lady, many years later in 1925, published an account of Coleridge at Highgate. And one of the main impressions left by that account is the obvious devotion which Coleridge inspired in them and the tremendous kindness he showed towards his adopted family. Although, needless to say, being Coleridge, affection could take somewhat mystifying forms. My father in his youth was sometimes sent up to the poet's room by his parents to ask for assistance on some difficult point in his school studies. This the poet often volunteered to give, but on one occasion, my father afterwards told me, his mentor gave him such a long discourse, interspersed with so many illustrations, even going back to the days of creation, that waiting in vain for the desired elucidation, he was obliged to walk backwards to the door and gradually in the same position going down the stairs, the poet stepping down after him, still enforcing his argument, he had to take advantage of a third person's appearance and retreat with his exercise out of the garden door. Not that escaping into the garden was a guarantee of safety, as Coleridge loved the garden, as he loved the walks around Highgate. His fondness for the place must in part have stemmed from the way it satisfied at once two of his most basic contradictory needs, both a proximity to the metropolitan centre and a removal, uh, the removal of a rural retreat, that delicious prospect of wood and meadow that Lee Hunt described. Coleridge clearly adored the place. He told a correspondent, the views from the garden side are substitutes for Cumberland, especially from the attic in which I and my books are now installed. So who needs the Lake District? He described to another correspondent the place's delicious groves and alleys, one of the finest in England, a grand cathedral aisle of giant lime trees. If he was getting restless or troubled towards the end of the day, the ever attentive Mrs. Gulman would, as someone remembered, suggest a walk to view the sunset from the Scotch fir grove and thus restore his spirits 
by her sympathetic attention to his rapturous remarks. He was, as the great R.D. Rawnsley recorded, a lover of the clouds, if ever a poet was. So it was fortunate, as Rawnsley went on, he pitched his tent on a hill from which, on most days and most nights, he could watch the memorable goings-on in the heavens. Perhaps his most momentous encounter was with a young poet called Keats in April 1819, which Keats uh, wrote up in a letter uh, sent to his brother and sister-in-law in America. Last Sunday, I took a walk towards Highgate, and in the lane that winds by the side of Lord Mansfield's park, I met Mr. Green, our demonstrator at Guy's. Keats at this stage is a medical student, in conversation with Coleridge. I joined them after inquiring by a look whether it would be agreeable. I walked with him at his alderman after dinner pace for near two miles, I suppose. In those two miles, he broached a thousand things. Let me see if I can give you a list. Nightingales, poetry, on poetical sensation, metaphysics, different genera and species of dreams, nightmare, a dream accompanied by a sense of touch, single and double touch, a dream related, first and second consciousness, the difference explained between will and volition, so say metaphysicians from a want of smoking the second consciousness, monsters, the kraken, mermaids, Southey believes in them, Southey's belief too much diluted, a ghost story, good morning. I heard his voice as he came towards me, I heard it as he moved away, I had heard it all the interval if it may be called so. He was civil enough to ask me to call on him at Highgate. Keats didn't call, as it happens, and so one of the great stories of English romanticism failed to occur. But his meeting, however inconsequential and meandering it might have felt at the time, seems nevertheless, nevertheless to have been a momentous episode in Keats's short writing life. For somewhere between late April and mid-May, so just a few weeks after this encounter, he wrote The Ode to a Nightingale, a poem that is about nothing if it's not about nightingales, poetry, on poetical sensation, metaphysics, different genera and species of dreams. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Coleridge later claimed that he had felt Keats was doomed when they met. When I shook him by the hand, there was death, he said. Coleridge himself died in 1834. His last recorded words, which he offered as evidence that although his body was failing, his mind remained quite unclouded, were, I could even be witty. He was buried at the old Highgate Chapel before being reinterred in St. Michael's in 1961. And his final resting place has always had visitors, many Americans. A clergyman named Prentice visited in 1842 and wrote back with an account of his adventure. I have just returned from a pilgrimage to his grave at Highgate, where he passed the last years of his life and where he died. The midsummer morning was perfect, and beyond the streets of London, new-made hay filled the air with its fragrance. When I reached Highgate Hill, a magnificent prospect suddenly opened before me. I soon found the house of the sexton. The name of the poet philosopher seemed to revive in his mind the pleasantest memories. Many and many a time, he said, he had served Mr. C at table. In his plain way, he drew a picture which anybody would recognize as that of a man remarkable alike for his gentleness and knowledge. I never saw the like of it, sir. He used to walk by the hour at a time under those trees, pointing to a row of fine old trees across the street, with his hat off and a book in his hand, and he was the greatest talker in the world. Well, what did he talk about? I asked. Oh, about the supreme being, religion, eternity, and such things. Oh, wow.
SGC's final home here in Highgate was here at number three, The Grove, a late 17th century villa just across the road from Morton House where he had begun. It was SDC's final home in the village and he, was, he remained with the Gilmans throughout and this was the epicentre of the final chapter of his life here in the village. It was here that he held his extraordinary Wednesday afternoon meetings with the great and good of the day, meetings which would frequently consist of nothing other than a two-hour monologue from the poet, surrounded by awestruck young intellectuals who had beaten the path to his door here in Highgate. Here he grew older and wiser, walking into the village as the renowned sage of Highgate and being teased by and laughing with the local children of the time. And of course, it was here that he finally died peacefully, exactly 187 years ago, today. On July the 10th, 1834, STC's nephew and son-in-law, Henry, made a final entry in his book, Table Talk, which was published later. It was something that the poet had written in a letter some years before. As Holmes put it, who could tell what point he had reached in his wonderful story, whether he was still voyaging outwards or already coming back? I am dying, he wrote, but without expectation of a speedy release. Is it not strange that very recently bygone images and scenes of early life have stolen into my mind, like breezes blown from the spice islands of youth and hope? those twin realities of this phantom world. I do not add love, for what is love but youth and hope embracing, and so seen as one? I say realities, for reality is a thing of degrees, from the Iliad to a dream. As he closed those extraordinary eyes, he told a friend that his mind was clear and quite unclouded. Then he added with growing interest, I could even be witty. I'm now standing under the chapel at Highgate School. Uh, this, in fact, wasn't built until 1867. Before that, as you will see in a moment, uh, this was just uh, open land where the good and the great of the village uh, were uh, buried. It was, wasn't in any way exclusive. It was, it was a burial ground uh, for the whole community. Samuel Taylor was buried here in 1834. Some years later, his nephew and son-in-law was also uh, interred here, and his wife, who we hadn't seen for many years, uh, in 1845, his wife Sarah. Then later in 1852, his beloved daughter also ended up in this uh, space. Uh, it's not known precisely when this mausoleum was built, uh, but uh, by the time it was built, uh, all the Coleridge's would have found their way into here. It's reasonable to assume that that was in about 1867. 
so it was in 1960, after the family had been interred here for getting on for 100 years, a, a campaign was run by a, a not very well-known uh, English novelist with uh, money raised from the United States uh, to enable the whole group to be reinterred. And they were uh, taken from here and interred under St. Michael's, where they have remained uh, up until now and uh, in the derelict state in which uh, you have uh, already seen them. It has been said that uh, the Coleridge's were moved from one tip to another tip. Immediately behind me is uh, Highgate School Chapel, uh, built in 1867 on what was then uh, the common land in Highgate and uh, in particular the land where burials for the whole community took place. And it was here that uh, Samuel was first buried and it was under this building in 1867 that the five members of the Coleridge family ended up. And so our story ends here. Well, we hope the story of STC doesn't end here. For well over 200 years, my forebears' thoughts have spread across the globe, inspiring artists, writers, poets, and thinkers in many different countries. His archives are kept in Texas and Toronto universities, as well as the British Library. And his thoughts are kept in the minds of everyone who has ever sailed with him and his ancient mariner. We hope you've enjoyed this short film and perhaps are able to contribute to the objectives we have in mind. We also hope that more than anything, you help keep the spirit, values and inspiration of Samuel Taylor Coleridge alive in our nations and the world's lives and memories. We now finish with a short service to commemorate in his own words, not only the death of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, but his life's work and the lives of those who lie buried with him. But oh, how oft, how oft at school, with most believing mind, presageful have I gazed upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger. And as oft, with unclosed lids, already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace, and the old church tower, whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening, all the hot fair day, so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure, falling on mine ear, most like articulate sounds of things to come. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Sarah Coleridge, his wife. Sarah Coleridge, his daughter. Henry Nelson Coleridge, his son-in-law. Herbert Coleridge, his grandson. Stop, Christian passerby. Stop, child of God, and read with gentle breast beneath this sod a poet lies, or that which once seemed he. Oh, lift one thought in prayer for STC, that he who many a year with toil of breath found death in life may here find life in death. Mercy for praise, to be forgiven for fame. He asked and hoped through Christ. Do thou the same. Eternal God, 
our maker and redeemer. Grant us with Samuel, Sarah, Henry, Sarah, and Herbert, and all the faithful departed, the sure benefits of your son's saving passion and glorious resurrection, that in the last day, when you gather up all things in Christ, we may with them enjoy the fullness of your promises. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Many thanks to you all for joining us on this great day and for helping us remember the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge and his family who lie in our crypt. Many thanks too to all those who helped and worked hard to make this short film possible. Many thanks indeed. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. In 1961, the poet and his family were transferred from a local churchyard where they had been buried and reinterred in this rubble-strewn 17th-century wine cellar in the crypt of St. Michael's Church. The Coleridge Trust is aiming to raise enough money to have their resting place rebuilt so they may lie in circumstances befitting the quality and unique power of his contribution to English literature. We shall now show details of how you may contribute to this venture. We hope you have enjoyed this attempt to give a flavour of the poet's life in Highgate. If you would like to raise any issues or comment on any aspect of the film and meet the two academics, Malcolm Geit and Seamus Perry, alongside Richard Coleridge, please stay on this Zoom call for our virtual roundtable talk. Great. So if everything's working, um, I'm going to hand over, it, it, it says Alan and Ginny on there, but it's not. It's actually Richard Coleridge and Drew Clode. Um, can, you, can you hear me, Drew? Can you hear me, Richard? Can you say hello? Hello. Yeah, I think we can just about hear you. So I'll hand over to Drew. Um, thank you very much. You You're on, Drew. All right. <laughs> well, the technical issues are still there, but not as bad as they were before. <laughs>
Uh, welcome back. And we are actually now um, sitting in the cellar that we saw so beautifully filmed earlier. Might introduce again Richard Coleridge, who, as you heard, is the poet's great, 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 great grandson. And he is with me, he, uh, with me to help as well. Seamus um, Perry and Malcolm Dyke, too, should be available to answer your questions as well. But first, just a couple of personal thanks. Um, Firstly, I must thank the friends of Coleridge, who have given unstinting help, support, and, uh, and aid throughout this making of this film. They looked at the script, but ever since the um, the charity was founded, to to so, so, so Justin Shepherd, um, Ian Enters, and Kerry Sackett for the benefit of of, of of Coleridge, many many thanks. Uh, secondly, to our chair, who the see and West for the enormous amount. He put in to the making of the film and the, the incredible sort of deployment of skill in editing. It's just a truly a wonderful experience. I've seen many things edited in my life, but never a film. And this was a learning curve for me. And finally, to Richard here himself, who has been a loyal friend of the uh, Coleridge Trust since its inception and has helped enormously with this film. With this film. He's never failed to offer us wise and practical advice, and we have never failed to benefit from it. That's enough for me. We're now going into a Zoom session, I hope. Um, over now to Adam, who, who will help Richard and uh, Seamus and Malcolm and myself answer any of the points you care to write. Good luck. Thank you very much, Drew. I think the easiest way I hope to do this, because we've got so many people on, and I've got everybody on mute except for Seamus, Malcolm, and uh, Drew and Richard, um, is probably just to use the um, uh, the um, hand hand lifting button on your on your on your Zoom call, uh, the emoji, and then I can I can unmute you to ask the question. Um, can someone who's got a question do do that one? See if that works, and see if I can see you. Raising. Oh, I can see me. I've raised my hand. Um, so it, it is. It's, it's, called, <laughs> it's a reaction. Uh, in the reactions box, there's something called. I'm going to lower my hand. <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a. You can raise raise an option to raise your hand. I've got a I've got a sneaky suspicion that we're probably going to have to scan the tool thing. Well, everybody's being incredibly shy. Well, they're, they're having to ask a question and test the technology at the same time. <laughs> there you go. So it's interesting. So we don't don't actually have any questions for. Uh, perhaps just while people are thinking about how to raise their hands or whether to do so, can I just say, having seen the full film for the first time, just say a thank you to those that have made it. I thought it it all worked together very well in sequence and. Uh, it was lovely to get those double glimpses, both of the actual filming around Highgate and in front of the houses on the one hand, and then those lovely line drawings. I particularly love that uh, that drawing of Coleridge in his book room, in that upstairs, mm. room, sitting there, the books along the wall. It's it's an enduring image of, of the sage and um, one that inspires me. All the books have just come down from my shelves as we're literally moving house the day after tomorrow. Um, but I think of him after all his voyages moving and, and as it were, kind of somehow up in the crow's nest of that house, looking out over the country in London. I find it very inspiring whenever I'm in Highgate to gaze up at that window and think of all that took place there. Yes, absolutely. And I thought uh, Malcolm's talk was so good because it made the connection between the Highgate Coleridge and the Coleridge who was, you know, still primarily a poet of the 1790s and and you do get that wonderful sense at the end of his of, of his highgate years of having sort of completed a circle in in, mm. in some you know extraordinary way and i i thought that what malcolm was saying brought that out you know wonderfully well 
Thank you. I mean, of course, the, the Mariner's Voyage is in fact a circumnavigation. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, as well as a move between the two polar hemispheres. And that's an extraordinary anticipation because, of course, one of the um, things that comes out in his later Highgate thinking and philosophy is, is what he called polar logic and polar mm -hmm. thinking. He even developed a symbol for it about how apparent contraries mutually inhabit and need one another. And I sometimes think that some of the very sharp binary, you know, uh, conflictual thinking that's afflicting us now could do with a bit of Coleridgean <laughs> polarity to be resolved. I think he's a thinker for our times and for the for the future of ecological crisis that we're moving into. I, I think we may look back to him, but he's already looked forward for us. Yeah. I'm still looking for hands. I don't see any, so <laughs> I can. I guess I could take take a, 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 unless anybody. Um, so I'll, I'll hand back very quickly to Drew and Richard, and maybe you can bring this to a conclusion, um, because I guess everybody's got what they wanted from from myself. I just have. Uh, I just like to say. Um, Thank you to uh, to Malcolm and thank you to Shameless uh, to both of you for, for for giving us so much of your time with your talks um, and also um, uh, to say that the uh, the video uh, um, that we showed you it will be up on our STC channel in the, on our YouTube uh, on YouTube and we've also have a website with all, all this information on it as well, which is just called the Coolridge Trust. Uh, and the Coolridge Trust also has the details of the bank details for those of you that missed it on the video that uh, I see on the chat bar they're, they're asking about it. Uh, before, before we go any further, I see a hand raise. So let's do something about it. Uh, Walton, if you'd like to unmute. Um, it's me, uh, Alan. And who would you like to ask a question of? Well, Malcolm and um, Seamus. Okay. Um, uh, Richard Holmes writes in the biography that it's necessary uh, for somebody to choose between Wordsworth and Coleridge. You can only be passionately a follower of one or the other. What do you both think about this? Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I go first? Yeah, you well, go. <clears throat> I'm going to cite your position because I was taught by a person called Jonathan Wordsworth, who was the great, great, I can't remember now, great, great, great nephew of the poet. <clears throat> and it was certainly, uh, he was a very charismatic man, uh, and it was certainly part of my own psychological defence to become a Coleridgean <laughs> rather than a Wordsworthian, because uh, I, I saw the way that things are going in that direction. Uh, but, I mean, Jonathan, you know, knew Coleridge deeply, and the reason I became a Coleridgean was because Jonathan, um, you know, taught him so compellingly and made such great connections between, you know, things that on the surface seem as dissimilar as the ancient mariner on the one hand and the first books of Wordsworth's Prelude on the other hand and showed how they were coming out of a shared conversation that these two extraordinary young men were having at the end of the 18th century. So I, I don't think you, I don't think you absolutely have to choose. It's true that Coleridgeans can often be very cross about the way that they feel Wordsworth treated their boy. Um, and I think that Wordsworth sometimes was a bit unsympathetic towards Coleridge, but then, you know, he, was struggling with someone who was a, an addict in an in a age that didn't understand what addiction meant or you know, what it you know what it was as a psychological phenomenon. So I think you know there was some sympathy to be had on, on Wordsworth's part there. Um, yeah. And Wordsworth, at the very end of his days, he never ever said anything other than that. That Coleridge is one of the greatest, you know, or perhaps the greatest genius that he'd ever known. So. I think I think you can have them both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I mean, I, I, I think it's fair to say that if I were forced to choose, then I would, of course, choose Coleridge. But in fact, I don't think it's a real choice, partly because um, 
Wordsworth wouldn't have become Wordsworth without Coleridge. And some of the finest things we love in Wordsworth, which Wordsworth does, you know, at greater extent perhaps than Coleridge did, are things that Coleridge inspired. I mean, I think it's remarkable that the prelude, which is not the title that that uh, that Wordsworth gave to his poem, the prelude in Wordsworth's day was simply known as the poem to Coleridge. It's addressed to Coleridge. And in fact, Coleridge's own poem about hearing Wordsworth read that early version of the prelude, which was also generous given the, the tensions between them at the time, Coleridge's poem about that is, is, uh, is itself one of the finest appreciations of Wordsworth's poetry uh, that's ever been written. Uh, also, from my perspective, um, reading Coleridge's appreciation of Wordsworth in that poem did send me back to Wordsworth. It also helped me in another direction. You may remember that in that poem about listening to Wordsworth read the poem, um, I mean, Coleridge gives you the experience of being carried out on the, on a, on a sort of voyage of, of Wordsworth's imagery. But you remember the very last line of that poem is, and when I rose, I found myself in prayer. And um, that line of Coleridge's was a clue to me or a hint to me that the passion I'd had for these romantic poets in my own atheist and agnostic youth and student days where they had been my religion where that basically they, that passion need not be left behind at the church door that you know when I rose I found myself in prayer became a way forward for me personally in the journey from poet to priest so I appreciate both of them uh, as I say not least with a sense that Coleridge among his many gifts to the world has given us the words with we enjoy and appreciate mm. Mm. Thank you both very much. Very glad that Seamus um, included that wonderful Keats story. Yes. And um, I'd often thought they talked about Nightingales. He wrote, he wrote, he he wrote the Ode to a Nightingale not long afterwards. But I hadn't seen, which I thought was a brilliant thing of Seamus's, how the very list that he gives, the opening of that list, is itself almost a key to the Ode to a Nightingale. I thought that was very well observed. And of course, just as Coleridge encouraged Wordsworth and Wordsworth encouraged Coleridge, certainly in those early days, notwithstanding later tensions, just think what the pair of them together gave as generative writers to every, every without question, every other generation of English poets, significant English poets have drawn from the two of them. If you know, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have Ted Hughes being Ted Hughes the way he is without without Wordsworth uh, or indeed Coleridge, I think. So I think they're, they 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 have a kind of they have another kind of lineage. They have a creative lineage as well as a a critical and theological one. And Jonathan Bate has said that lyrical ballads is possibly the most important uh, literary event in our whole culture. That's that's powerful, but I, I I think you could defend that for sure. I think there's something in that. I think there might be a claim for Paradise Lost or Shakespeare's <laughs> first folio, but I mean, I, I, I'm sure Jonathan's right about it at some level. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Val. Um, okay, so I don't see anybody else raising their hand, so I'm going to hand back to um, uh, Drew and. Richard, uh, to bring the call to a conclusion. Um, yes, I'd just like to thank Drew and Owen for inviting me here today. Um, uh, as, a, uh, as a Coleridge myself, um, it's always a privilege to be invited to these things. Um, however, I do enjoy supporting causes um, that clearly going to help the local community and the local economy um, and in this case as well which will also help um, St Michael's Church. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone who's uh, zoomed in today and obviously Malcolm and Chambers for their input which is always uh, interesting and at times exciting as well. I always learn something new. Um, I'm nowhere near a uh, college expert, and uh, it's great to hear these people 
talk about my ancestor in such a way and uh, in a way that I've never really heard in depth. So thank you, thank you, Sarah. All right, I echo those thanks and remind everyone that we are I'm just behind us here. Ah, uh, the coffin is, is what is, you probably can't see it quite as well as we can, but overall all strewn cellar. And it really is, is a shame that they can't be given something more fitting. And I, I'd like to end on that note. That's what the charity is about. Um, with your help, we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, apologies for the uh, technical glitch in the uh, in the crypt itself. We did have a camera set up in there, but it decided to die from the moment that we needed it. Um, so uh, we had to make do with our church laptop, which <laughs> I don't know how many generations behind the times it is. So, so it was a bit of a gurgle there, but I think we managed to um, uh, get the gist of what Richard and Drew were telling us. Uh, and, and again, thank you all for, for, for joining this call. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, like I say, we've got a website, it's called thecoolridgetrust.com, um, which has got all the details of uh, what you need to know <coughs> about what we're doing. Um, and we also have a, um, uh, an S, um, uh, a cooler, it's called The Cooler Ridge Trust um, uh, channel on uh, YouTube as well. So um, uh, we've got a couple of videos on there at the moment. We've got the promo for this one. We've got, uh, I think that the, the video for this call is also up there, but I'll also put the recording um, of, of this Zoom call on there uh, in, in, in the next couple of days. And of course, we've got One Kiss, the, um, which I think is an amazing piece of music that was written by Paul Dean and sung so beautifully by um, the St. Michael's Church Choir, um, which I hope you all enjoyed. So on that note, thank you again, and I shall close this call. Good. Hi, all. A bit of atmosphere, a bit of th thunder, thunder and lightning going on in the background here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.